So welcome back. I'm glad you're here. I want to begin again with another, another little video that uh, tells a little bit of the history and the life of St. Peter's. Uh, the one we saw last week was that St. Peter's was founded uh, uh, by a group of folks who are members of St. Paul's Clifty out here on State Road, Road 7 uh, because they got tired of crossing uh, the creek. And uh, what happened was, actually a story was that a baby almost drowned uh, going across the creek one year, and they said, enough of that. We're not going to keep dealing with that. That's too dangerous. So uh, let me try to get the next one up here, and I think we're good to go. Come and stop blowing up. Okay, we're going to. There we go. St. Peter's Lutheran Church began on January 10, 1858, when the congregation of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Clifton resolved to solicit funds for a new church building in Columbus. Due to sometimes dangerous and long trips to reach the church, it was necessary to find a location in Columbus that would best suit the German immigrants who lived there. So the decision was made to release five families from St. Paul to begin the new congregation. The five organizers were Henry Faring, Ernest Kaiser, August Kiel, Gustav Kiel, and August Gilker. On July 22nd, 1858, a lot 75 feet by 150 feet was purchased on the southeast corner of Harrison, now known as Fifth Street, and Sycamore. A small wooden frame building was erected in that location and used as a church and a school. St. Paul's pastor, Reverend A. Zagel, led the once a month services until 1860. His successor at St. Paul's, Reverend E. Rolfe gave two sermons each month at St. Peter's until 1864. Finally, in that year, St. Peter's membership had grown large enough to call its own minister, Pastor George Kekla. By the early 1870s, St. Peter's was firmly rooted in Christ. Okay. to where we left off last time. There we go. Okay, so welcome back. If anybody uh, needs a workbook, we have extras here. Did anybody uh, not get one? Help yourself and help yourself to a Bible, and I've got extra Bibles if you need one, okay? Paula, your book is over here. Your name, here we go. Here's yours right here. It showed up. And if anybody needs Bibles, I'll put a couple of extras over here, and help yourself, they are for you. I should have put more out. So help yourselves if you need those. So last week uh, we said that this is our, our Bible investigation class, uh, that we are going to examine what does the Bible say uh, to us about uh, who we are and about the God uh, who has created this universe and given to us life and breath. And, uh, and if you have questions along the way, feel free to ask. Uh, I put the 4 by 6 card on your table again. I didn't find any with questions on it last week. If there were any, then, then we just overlooked it. So if, if you wrote a question down, be sure to write it down again, and hopefully that will get to me um, this week, and we'll do the best that we can to answer those. Last week we said that the word Bible simply means book, that the word scripture is simply a collection of writings, that the Muslims have their scriptures, that the, uh, the Hindus have their scriptures, that the... Uh, the Latter-day Saints have their scriptures, the Christians have their scriptures, um, the Jews have their scriptures, and really our scriptures are really the scriptures of the Jews with some additional uh, uh, books added in. Uh, so Jesus, the Bible of Jesus, was uh, Genesis through Malachi. Uh, Jesus would have known the scriptures very, very well. We have referred to it as the Old Testament, but that was the Bible of Jesus. Jesus would have grown up committing almost to memory everything in the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And almost everything that Jesus teaches in the scriptures, uh, we can find in those writings of Moses, known as the Torah. Uh, and so it's very much based upon that. Some people say, well, the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. Oh, yes, it does. 
The Old Testament is, is the foundation on which Jesus taught. And Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises that God dropped along the way in what we know as the Old Testament. So uh, we just talked about these kind of things last week, but ultimately we said everything that we find in the Bible points us to the person of Jesus. Um, we also looked at this map, which is really a map of everything that we find in the scriptures. We said that, at least from my perspective, the Garden of Eden was probably somewhere in this area because it talks about how the Garden of Eden, the book of Genesis, was surrounded by the Tigris River, the Euphrates River, and then two others. The two others, we don't know where they are anymore, but the Tigris and Euphrates still remain here um, in that area. And so uh, the Garden of Eden. And then uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob lived in this area here. When Moses came along about 500 years after Abraham, uh, Moses was born here in Egypt and then led the people across the Red Sea to Mount Sinai um, up toward the Promised Land. Jesus lived in the land of Palestine, and when Jesus then sent his disciples out, they went up into to Europe and Asia Minor, Africa and India and other parts of the world, taking the message of Jesus um, to others. So that's really a map of, uh, of Bible lands. Then we said, um, as we go to another uh, map, this was the journey that Moses led the people on down here to Mount Sinai, where he gave them the Ten Commandments, and we will spend... It won't be for uh, many weeks down the road, but we'll spend about three weeks unpacking the Ten Commandments. And what do they say to us today? They're just as relevant today as they were back then. And, and how do we translate that? How do we interpret all of that? But that's the journey that Moses led the people in. You can see up here at the top at Mount Nebo. Moses died on top of Mount Nebo. And then Joshua led them across the Jordan River to Jericho. And as Joshua led them into the land, then the land was divided. This is that land uh, here's the Jordan River here. Mount Nebo is about here where they crossed over. And uh, so that was the land. It was divided among the, the sons of uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the 12 tribes. And so it was divided among uh, them. You can see by way of cities at Bethlehem and Jerusalem are only about five miles apart. Bethlehem being the town where Jesus was born, Jerusalem uh, where he died. And he grew up in uh, Nazareth. You can see that in large print by the Sea of Galilee, and it's about 65 miles from Nazareth down to Jerusalem. So a little bit less than it is uh, from here to Louisville. What is it for where to exit 68? So we're about the same distance. Um, uh, if if uh, Columbus is Nazareth and, uh, and Jerusalem is Louisville, that's about the distance, so not very far um, at all. So that's what we're going to pick up. And so we're on the table of contents is what we're doing. We're going through the table of contents, and some of you say, ah, oh, that's Boersville. But I want you to understand how all this connects. I don't think it's Boersville, but uh, I want you to see how it all connects. This is a Bible investigation class. And Jesus, who is the central figure in all of that, um, very much understood what happened in these different books of the Bible and how all that ultimately points us toward him. So we are, I'm not sure what page that's on, like what, two or three or page three. That's where we are, page three. And, uh, and we made our way. And by the way, if you weren't with us last week, you can watch last week's class on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find it there. Go to Bible Investigation <coughs> class. You can find it. And if you don't have access to that, but you would rather have the class on a DVD or a jump drive, uh, let me know, and we can make uh, Dean can make copies of that. So we're going to encourage everyone to go to the YouTube channel if that's if they have access to that. It's just simpler, but if not, uh, we can make those copies uh, for you. So last week we made our way down through. Uh, I think we just were kind of picking up with First and Second Samuel. Is that right? Those who were here. So First uh, and Second Samuel. First and Second Samuel is really about the life of King David. Um, David lived around the year 1000 B.C. We said that the, uh, the nation of Israel didn't have a king until about 1050 B.C. The other nations had kings, and they wanted a king. And God said, I'm, I'll take care of you. I'm your king. They had judges, and we talked about that. But we also find that around 1050 B.C., God said, okay, I'll give you a king. And the first king was named Saul, S-A-U-L. And Saul started off very good. Uh, he didn't finish very well. I kind of refer to Saul as the Pete Rose syndrome. You know, Pete Rose, in my opinion, was one of the best baseball players. I don't know if he was the most talented, but he was one of the best. He, he worked, he, his work ethic was incredible. And, uh, and he, you know, he wasn't the fastest. Uh, he wasn't the most powerful. He didn't have the strongest arm, but he, statistically, he was way up at the top. Unfortunately, he didn't finish very well. Um, he made some decisions that 
uh, the gods of baseball didn't agree with, and so his finish was not very good. And, and so King Saul started off very well. The problem came when Saul began to be eaten up with envy and jealousy about this young man named David. So David was the youngest of, I think, eight sons. And, uh, and when, when the nation of Israel, they'd been attacked um, uh, by the Philistines. And the Philistines were over here on the Mediterranean Sea. And the Philistines had a soldier whose name was Goliath. And you've heard of David and Goliath. And Goliath was, I mean, he, I, I remember, um, this was a number of years ago, before 9-11. And my son and I, somebody had given us uh, tickets to a Pacer game. They were still in Market Square Arena, so a long time ago. And in those days, you could walk down uh, by the court. So security, no big deal. So we got there early, so we just walked down around, you know, we were walking around the court. And, and the, the uh, Pacers were playing the Magic, and then Shaq was playing for the Orlando Magic. And so here David and I are, about five feet away from Shaquille O'Neal, and they're in their lines doing their layups. And, we, and this guy is just a monster of a man. I know when you see him on TV, he looks big, but stand next to him. He is huge. And, uh, and, and yet, if you look at Shaq's uh, uh, measurements compared to Goliath, Shaq would have been small. Shaq would have been, if you're kind of an old-fashioned basketball guy, because I don't pay as much attention now, Mug, was it Muggsy Bogues, was that his name? Mm-hmm. Like five foot six, or five, he could dunk, I think, but he was like five foot six or five foot seven. It was like Muggsy Bogues standing against Shaq. I mean, just no comparison whatsoever. So, so Shaq would have been small compared to Goliath. So Goliath says to his uh, captain, listen, why don't you just tell the leader of the Israelite army, let's just settle this, let's just spare a lot of lives, just tell them, bring their, their fiercest warrior, put them up against me one-on-one, and then whoever wins that battle, then win or take all. Then, then we're done. And he was trash-talking Israel. He was trash-talking the king of Israel, who was Saul. He was trash-talking the God of Israel. Well, David hears about this. And David's a kid. He's a teenager. And David hears about how this guy named Goliath is trash-talking his God. And David said, that's not right. Well, nobody had the guts to say, I'll take on Goliath, because they didn't think they would win. So David says, I got it. So here's David, this little runt, the youngest of eight kids. And you know the story. He, he got, one, got a couple of stones and a slingshot, and he hit Goliath square in the head and, and killed him, cut off his head, and, and David was the victor. Well, David, you can imagine, became quite popular in the land. Saul didn't go up against him. Saul could have. Saul was a big guy, not as big as Goliath. And the other warriors could have gone up against them, but only David had the guts to do that. And so the women began to sing the praises of David. Now, the Bible does tell us in other places that David was a good-looking young man and that he was a musician. You know, I mean, you know, good looks and a musician. I mean, yeah, you're kind of a, a star, right? And so David was a star. And so the women were, and they had a song, a chorus that said, Saul, the, the current king, Saul has slain his thousands but David, his tens of thousands. In other words, David's the man. And Saul became envious about that. And he didn't handle that very well. On top of that, when it was time to find a successor, for, while Saul was still living, but they wanted to find the successor, and they identified, David was identified as a successor, so now David's going to be the successor to Saul. Uh, not that Saul's being driven out. Saul will be king until he dies. But the people really love David. So Saul became eaten up with envy. And Saul did everything in his power to destroy David. And uh, and Saul Saul even tried to kill David. And we're told on occasion that David had the opportunity once to kill Saul. He could have. It would have been easy. Saul was not paying attention to David. And he could have killed him. But he didn't because he was respectful of his king. Uh, So David was this superhero. Um, And in fact, of all the kings of Israel, David by far is the most popular. And all the prime ministers, all the president, David is still by far the most, the most popular. But David also uh, had his shortcomings, like all of us, uh, where we read about not only David and Goliath, but we read about David and Bathsheba. David was, uh, now Saul has passed away, David's the king, and we're told that uh, David's men are off fighting a battle somewhere. Uh, David reigned in a time of great uh, military conflict, and so his men were off fighting the battle. And, uh, and so David is back in his palace, and he's up on the roof. And uh, you may say, why was he on the roof? Well, if you go to the Middle East, most of the houses have flat roofs. 
and the roof was a place of socialization. Uh, the roof was like the deck. The roof was like the patio. So on the roof, you'd have your Weber grill or your big green egg. On the roof, you'd have your lawn chairs. On the roof, you'd have your picnic table. On the roof, you might play cornhole. A lot of activities up on the roof. And so David was up on the roof one day, and he looks out, and he sees nearby on another roof a very attractive woman who was preparing to bathe. And David sees her. David's married, uh, but David sees her, and he wants her for himself. Sometimes when people get in positions of power, they think the rules don't apply to them. Have you ever noticed that? That can happen in politics. It can happen in business. It can happen in the church. It can, hap it can happen anywhere. Sometimes people in positions of power, uh, the longer they're there, sometimes they get the impression the rules don't apply to me. So David has Bathsheba. What's she going to say? I mean, he's the king. She's like, she going to say no? I mean, she might have tried to say no. So he has her way with that, his way with Bathsheba. And then uh, she conceives as he's having her way with her. Yeah, but she happens to be married. David knew that. And so David says, oh, uh, we've got a problem here. So he said, I want her husband brought back home so that he can be with her and sleep with her so that he thinks this is his baby. And, and so uh, her husband, whose name was Uriah, if you're like my age, if you were like a rock and roll guy, there was a group called Uriah's Heap. Like I don't even remember any song that they sang, but I remember their name, Uriah's Heap. And uh, I don't know if they were named for Uriah. I have no idea. But Uriah said, you know what? I, that would be wrong. I can't leave my fellow soldiers. These guys, some of them are dying. They're risking their lives. It wouldn't be right for me to go back and enjoy my wife when these guys are putting their neck on the line. So now David has a dilemma. And so David then says to his military people, hey, put Uriah up in the front line of battle. Why? Because he wants Uriah killed so, Uriah, so he, everything's clean. And Uriah doesn't know what happened. So, and then finally, then, a guy named Nathan, who was a prophet of God, came to David, and he kind of painted a picture and said, David, you messed up, man. <laughs> you messed up. I don't care if you're king. You messed up. And David came to the realization, sometimes we get so caught up, sometimes emotion can lead us to do certain things that we later regret. And I think that can happen with a lot of us. We, we get so caught up in the emotion of whatever it might be, that we make decisions uh, because we feel, I mean, our emotions are leading us in that direction when in reality it was really a bad choice. And in hindsight we see that, but in the moment we don't. And so David uh, confessed his sin and, and acknowledged that. But in the midst of all of that, God says of David that David is a man after God's own heart. Now go figure that out. You know, he, he had another man's wife for himself. He had her husband killed. Here's the reality. All of us mess up in life. The Apostle Paul wrote half the New Testament. One of the greatest spokesmen for Jesus who I think we've ever known. But Paul said of himself, he said, the good that I want to do, I don't always do. And the evil that I don't want to do is sometimes exactly what I do. I can relate to that. That's me. Sometimes the good that I want to do and the evil I don't want it, like, Mark, you idiot, what were you thinking? <clears throat> and my guess is that we can all relate to that if we're honest with ourselves. And ultimately, David had a heart that wanted to honor God. He, he wanted to serve God. He wanted to do the right thing. But like the rest of us, he was human. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say, well, what David did was okay. It wasn't okay. Um, but David is a central figure uh, in the scriptures. And he's still the most beloved king of all of Israel. And, and so then David, when David died, he had a son named Solomon. And we hear about the wisdom of King Solomon. Solomon was the guy who uh, uh, one day a couple of uh, uh, women were brought to him and they would each had a baby. And one woman's baby died uh, very, very uh, young and she uh, stole the other baby, uh, and she said, that was, she, she said, that woman's baby died, not mine. And they, brought, they came to the king, and they wanted the king to settle it. And Solomon didn't know who the mother was. They didn't have DNA tests or anything else. And Solomon said, and he prayed to God for wisdom, and he said, well, why don't we just cut the baby in half 
and then we'll give one half to one woman and one half to the other. And, and the one who was the mother of that baby said, give her the baby. And, then, and the other said, no, cut it in half. And uh, so Solomon then you know, figured out who was the mother. Solomon was known for his, uh, his wisdom. Um, and Solomon reigned during a very peaceful time. So when we move from 1st and 2nd Samuel to 1st and 2nd Kings, the next two books, 1st and 2nd Kings are really about the kings of Israel and of Judah. And we'll get to how they, they broke off in just a minute. So Saul started off a great king, didn't finish very well because of his jealousy toward David. Um, David uh, is highly revered, wasn't perfect, but, but was a good king. Um, if you could take away <coughs> what happened with Bathsheba and Uriah. And, uh, and then Solomon reigned during a peaceful time. So David had to use all of the, the, the government money on military. I mean, he was fighting battles. He had to feed his soldiers. He had to have uh, you know, equipment for them. So the, 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 the treasury for the nation was pretty much used up in fighting battles. But when you don't have to fight battles, then you can build up your treasury. So in Solomon's time, there was a lot of money to go around. And Solomon was very wealthy. And the book of Ecclesiastes is about Solomon trying to figure out contentment in life because Solomon was, you know, he, he was, he was, Solomon was going through a midlife crisis, and we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. But Solomon then had a son named Rehoboam. So Saul was the first king, and then after that, David wasn't his relative. Then came um, uh, David, and then David's son Solomon, Solomon's son Rehoboam. Rehoboam wasn't as wise as his dad. And Rehoboam said, listen, my dad had all these advisors, and they appeared to be helpful to him, but I don't need them. I don't want their advice. I'm going to do things my way. I, I don't care what they've done in the past. I don't care what, what you know, history has taught us. I'm going to do things my way. And, and so what happened was Rehoboam made a lot of bad choices. He, was, he wasn't going to listen to anybody else. I know what's best. And so um, the nation became divided under his very poor and ineffective leadership. And so uh, the northern part of the kingdom retained the name of Israel. By the way, the name Israel, um, you got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Abraham lived around 2000 BC. His son named, son named um, Isaac, and so Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had a dream in which he was wrestling with God. And one of the interpretations of Israel is wrestles with God. And when you think about it, as, as the people of God, sometimes we wrestle with God, don't we? We, 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 we want to do the right thing, but... So um, the northern kingdom retained the name of Israel. The southern kingdom took on the name of one of the tribes, which is the tribe of Judah. So now you've got the divided kingdom. They kind of had their own civil war. And the north, uh, the name of Israel. The south, the name of Judah. And so you can see that Jerusalem and Bethlehem are located in Judah, uh, Samaria, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the life and ministry of Jesus, uh, was in uh, uh, Israel, and then the Galilee up north, uh, where Jesus grew up, was also in what we know as Israel. So first and second kings are really about the history of the different kings who ruled over Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And you would think, because this is in the Bible, and these are God's people, that they would have been good godly kings. Most of them were rotten kings. They, they were not in sync with, with God. They kind of wanted to do their own thing. There was a lot of paganism, a lot of idolatry, a lot of political maneuvering. Political maneuvering can lead people to make bad choices. Sometimes it's a matter of doing what does God say, but we want to have all the, you know, this political strategy, and so we sell out. And that's what happened in many cases. And then First and Second Chronicles. First and Second Chronicles, if, if we were Jewish and we opened up our... Uh, uh, Bible, uh, what we know as the Old Testament, First and Second Chronicles will be at the end, which really makes more sense, because First and Second Chronicles is a summary of the history of everything we find in the Old Testament. I think it's San Francisco that has a newspaper called the San Francisco Chronicle. I think, and so First and Second Chronicles is a historical summary of everything that we read in the Old Testament. And again, in the, the Bible that Jesus would have had, 1st and 2nd Chronicles would have been at the end. It doesn't mean it's wrong, it's just that's where it's placed. So then, after 1st and 2nd Chronicles, we have Ezra, Nehemiah, 
and Esther. And in that bracket, you can see I have a bracket there to the left. I would suggest that you write um, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. The rebuilding of Jerusalem. Let me explain what I mean. So in the year 722 BC, uh, about 700 years before the time of Jesus, the Assyrians up in the north uh, Asia Minor, where Turkey is now located, the Assyrians came down and they attacked uh, a number of folks, including the land of Palestine. And they, they took many of those who lived in the land of Palestine, where the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob lived, and they took them back up into, into their area and they intermarried with them. Now that'll be worth remembering when we talk about the Samaritans a little bit later, but we won't worry about that now. But so they came and conquered in 722 uh, BC. Um, so David, again, um, Abraham, about 2000 BC, Moses uh, down in Egypt, leading up the promised land about 1500 BC, King David about 1000 BC, 722 BC, the Assyrians came down and attacked. After the Assyrians attacked, then came the Persians. Um, and not the Persians, the Babylonians. And the Babylonians came from this area, uh, again, the Tigris and Euphrates River, and they came and they conquered the Assyrians. And that was in 586 BC. So 722, the Assyrians came down and they conquered, and they ruled until 586 BC and 586. And so just before they conquered, the Babylonians came and they came to Jerusalem and they took the breast, best and the brightest of the Jews who lived around Jerusalem. They took uh, their engineers who could design things for them. They took their athletes. They took their beauty queens. They took, they took what in their mind were the most valuable people, the best and the brightest, back to benefit them. So when we read in the Bible, for example, about uh, Daniel and the lion's den, Daniel was in the lion's den back here in Babylon not in the area of Jerusalem. Daniel was one of the best and the brightest, and they, they carried Daniel off. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that we read about in the fiery furnace, the fiery furnace was back in this area, and they were some of the best and the brightest. Queen Esther, of whom we read in the book of Esther, uh, she was not yet born, but, but her mother and father uh, would have been taken in all of that. So the Babylonians came and they conquered, but before they did, they took the best and the brightest back with them because they wanted to use them. They wanted them to be their tools to build their kingdom. Then they came in 586 and conquered Jerusalem. They destroyed the city. They, 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 they burned down the city. They knocked down the walls. In those days, cities had large walls uh, built around them for protection. They knocked down the walls. Uh, they destroyed the temple that King Solomon, David's son, had built. Uh, where they worshipped um, the living God. And so, uh, 586 B.C. Um, and then after that uh, came uh, the Persians, and the Persians, Persian Gulf Persians came, and I don't have a map for that, but the Persians conquered all of that, and they went right up to Greece. And if you watch the movie 300, which I don't know, might be 10 years old, I think my daughter, yeah, when my daughter was at Michigan State, uh, they're the Spartans, and so before meets they would, or games, they would sometimes play the movie uh, 300 to kind of spur them on because of the Spartans. But anyway, they, they came to, it was a very bloody, gory movie, but it's a historical movie, and they tried to conquer Greece. And I won't tell you all about the movie, but I mean, kind of history kind of tells you. But um, so, so then they came about 70 years after the Babylonians had came, then the Persians came. Under the Persians then, under the Persians, the Persian king gave permission for some of the Jews to return to the city of Jerusalem to rebuild their city. Because they thought, we own it. Why let it stay in, in shambles? We, we might as well be fixed up. It's ours. So in the book of Ezra, uh, we read about how they went back and they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. And we'll talk about <coughs> the temple more later, uh, but the temple was built by King Solomon, and it was where they would bring their offerings to God, it was where they would gather, it was a place where the glory of God resided, um, but that's what the book of Ezra is all about, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Nehemiah 
is about how Nehemiah led the people back to rebuild the walls around the city. So now it could be a fortified city once again. <coughs> and then Esther is a story. So Esther's parents were part of the best, best and the brightest that were carried off to a Babylon. And so now when the Persians are ruling, King Xerxes, King Xerxes, who's a, he's not a God-honoring king, King Xerxes um, was considered a deity. That's how they viewed their king. They were God. And uh, his wife didn't please him. And when you're God, if your wife doesn't please you, you just find another wife. So he got rid of this wife who didn't please him. And so he had, to be very crass, he had a great big, I, 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 I know a lot of baseball, he had a big bullpen. He had a lot of people in the bullpen just waiting to get their chance to come into the game and to be the next queen. So, uh, so uh, Esther, this young Jewish girl, was selected to be the next queen, to be married to uh, the king. And, uh, and she was Jewish. He obviously wasn't. Uh, he could care less about her, her theology. Uh, there were other things that were more important to him. And so she was his wife. And, and during this time, um, his right-hand man, so you've got the king, and then you've got a guy named Haman. And Haman uh, did not like the Jews. He, long before Hitler tried to exterminate the Jews, was a guy named Haman, who lived around you know, 500 B.C., who wanted to see the Jews done away with. Because, here's why. Because these Jews who'd been carried off, you see, even though they'd been carried off into, to, uh, to Babylon and now under the Persian authority, um, they still worship their God. But in Persian mind, uh, the king was God. So everybody would bow down and worship the king. But people like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego wouldn't. That's why they landed in the fiery furnace. People like Daniel wouldn't. That's why they landed in the lion's den. So, so Haman wanted to get rid of all the Jews. And so he was having gallows built to hang the Jews, and he was going to come to the king with this plan to get rid of all the Jews. Well, Esther had an uncle or a cousin named Mordecai, and Mordecai was kind of an insider on what was going on, and he heard about Haman's plan. So he goes to his relative, Esther, and he said, Esther, his famous phrase was, for such a time as this, Esther, it's no accident. It is no accident that you are the queen right now because I want you to know that somebody very close to your husband is going to try to eliminate all of our people. And if you don't say anything, it's going to happen. If you say something, something might change. So Esther then goes before her husband. In those days, the only way you could approach the king, and even if you were his wife, was to have an invitation to come and speak to the king. You couldn't just, you couldn't just go in and, uh, and say, hey, I need to talk to you. If he didn't invite you, uh, the king could have your head chopped off, including if you were the queen. And remember, there were plenty of other girls in the bullpen to pick from if he didn't want to see you that day. And so, um, so Esther says, okay. And she goes in and she speaks to her husband and uh, she tells him what's going on. And the king became, becomes outraged. And so uh, he has Haman hung on the gallows and the Jews are spared. And all this is important because remember when God was dropping all these little clues in the scriptures about Messiah, he'd be a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and David and so forth. Um, had the Jewish people been wiped out, the line of Messiah would have been gone. See, not that God causes everything in history to happen. God didn't cause Hitler to do what Hitler did. God didn't cause Osama bin Laden to do what he did. But God is at work in all of that. And God can take even evil and turn it uh, for good, for his purposes. So when things begin to fall apart in the world, as they seem to be doing, understand that God is still on the throne. I, I, sometimes I wonder, like the future of our country, I'm thinking, I'm a little nervous about this, but God's still on the throne. Um, and, and so as, as things happen, uh, God is still God. And he was able to protect his people and, and see them through in the midst of, of all of that. So uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther about the rebuilding of, uh, of Jerusalem. Um, and, then, and that really 
chronologically, it kind of takes us to the old of the old end of the Old Testament because that takes us into like the 400 BC where it ends. So, if anybody says, "Well, the Bible's in chronological order," no, not really. And it doesn't have to be. It doesn't mean it's wrong. I mean, if you thought it was in chronological order, I mean, it may burst your bubble to know that it's not. But there's nothing wrong with that. But you just need to know that. So then after uh, that, you've got the book of Job. Uh, Job, if you're having a bad day, um, read the book of Job. Because uh, Job had some horrible days. Job was a wealthy man. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with wealth. The Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It says that the love of money is the root of all evil. So money is simply a resource that God gives to us. Um, the, the, but, but our attitude toward money is huge. So how do we view it? Uh, Jesus approached one day a young man who had a lot of wealth, and he just kept, he, he was stingy with his wealth. He wasn't sharing it, and he was just building bigger barns and bigger barns and bigger barns. And Jesus told this guy, sell everything you got and give it away. He doesn't tell us everybody that. If your attitude is right toward money, but if we are hoarding, and, and I'm, my pile is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're not generous with what we have, we're all called to be generous. It may be that God is saying to us, sell it and give it all away. Because I'm concerned about your attitude. This is just a resource I give to you. But there are others whom I put you in a position to help. And I want you to do that. So Job was a wealthy man, and he was a godly man. Uh, but, and he had a number of children. And he had a lot. One day, though, one day, uh, something horrible happened, and all ten of his kids died, and uh, all of his wealth was wiped out. And uh, some people get the impression, well, if bad things happen to me, it must be that God's trying to even the score. That is bad theology. I've heard people in the church when things don't go right in their life or the life of the church, well, you must be doing something wrong. Well, if when things begin to fall apart, we should always ask ourselves the question, is there something that I could do to avoid this? Right? I mean, there may be certain choices that we make in life that do lead to negative consequences. That is certainly possible. But just because something bad happens doesn't mean that somehow we brought that on ourselves. Job didn't do any. Job was sinful, just like the rest of us. But Job didn't do anything for God to like strike him with lightning. So be very careful. That's a, that's that's a, that's the way. Uh, uh, that's the Hindu concept of karma, which is not biblical. The Hindu concept of karma says that um, it, karma is the measurement of our good versus you know the scales of justice. And so if I'm weighing heavier on the side of good, then I have good karma. If I'm weighing heavier, that's Hindu, Hinduism is, I mean, there are a lot of Hindu folks that are good people, but the theology is very um, a counter to what the scriptures teach. Um, karma, the concept of karma says, because Hinduism believes in reincarnation, right? There's no, the Bible, in fact, the Bible says there is no such thing as reincarnation. The Bible says it's appointed for us to die once, and then comes the judgment. It doesn't say you die, and then based upon where you are, then you come back, and then based upon where you... The, there is no such thing as karma. I mean, there's no such thing as, as reincarnation. I know it's a common a philosophy among people today. It's very much a new age, which is just a, a reinvention of, of Hinduism. But there's no such thing as reincarnation. The Bible says you die, you stand before God, and then you spend eternity in one of two places. It doesn't say anything about uh, this concept of coming back to try to do better. So, so in that concept of, of Hindu karma and reincarnation, uh, it, that's the whole caste system. If you come back as a Dalit uh, uh, on the lowest end of the caste system as opposed to a Brahmin, then you're a Dalit because, or an untouchable because you merited that in your previous life. So we can't really help you because the only way for you to come back in the next life into a better position is for you to earn your way into that. That's not biblical. It's not what God teaches. So um, uh, we just need. So in Job's case, uh, Job, this godly man, his kids wiped out, his wealth taken away, and then after that, if that wasn't enough, uh, then he had this horrible uh, disease of the skin that was just—he was just miserable miserable. In fact, he was so miserable his wife came and said, why don't you just curse God and die? 
I said, no, I can't do that. But that's what she said. And what's interesting is that Job, at first, when he was dealing with all of this, he had three friends, and they came and they sat with him. And they just sat. They were just there. And sometimes when we're grieving, we just need people to be with us. We don't need to hear 35 Bible verses. You know? The next time you have uh, somebody close to you and they're grieving, uh, don't say, well, the Bible says God works all things together for good. That's not what they need to hear. Yes, that's what the Bible says. And yes, that's a true statement. But when you're grieving the death of your 16-year-old child or you're grieving the death of your spouse, or you're, don't come and say, well, God works all things together for good. Or God willed it. How do we know what God willed? How do we? What I know is that God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. I know that. But to say God willed that tsunami, God willed that tornado, God willed that death, God willed... I, I, I've learned, I, I don't say what God willed and what God didn't will. I just, I don't go there. I can't speak for him. I don't know. So, so his friends came and they just sat with him and he found comfort in that. But then, the longer his suffering endured, they said, Job, you must have done something to really irritate God. Now let's, do, let's think back, Job. What have you done? What could it be? And they just really got under his skin. I mean, Job knew he wasn't perfect, but... And sometimes we do that to ourselves, too. Life gets hard, and so we're thinking, is God trying to even the score with me? Is God trying to punish me? The Bible says that God poured out all of his wrath upon his son, stretched out upon a cross, who bore the weight of our sin. Jesus absorbed the full wrath of the holiness of God for our sins. Jesus absorbed that. Not you and me. So, so when bad things happen in life, you know, there may be consequences to certain bad choices that we make, but, but I guarantee you God's not trying to even the score with you because God doesn't operate that way. The balance sheet was taken care of. Uh, all of our debits, if you will, were placed on Jesus and all of his assets of his righteousness, his holiness, were transferred to our account. So I uh, just understand that, and that was part of Job's experience in all of that. Um, Psalms, Psalms was the hymn book or the song book of the people of God in biblical times. 150 Psalms, Hebrew poetry. And <clears throat> many of them are the basis of our hymns and the songs that we sing, many of them. They're very dear to us in many ways. It's interesting in the Psalms, again, the songbook of the uh, people of Bible times, that um, I always, you know, at St. Peter's we're beyond this. I should hope that we're beyond this. But we, like a lot of churches, went through the worship wars like almost 30 years ago, you know, um, because uh, we began to introduce alternate styles of worship. So before it was the pipe organ and you know maybe some brass or those kind of things and we began to say that's great that's good we want to continue to do that and do that well but we also recognize that some people connect with god uh, maybe in a different way and so let's do that musically in a different way and uh, so now we have the two services new song and classical praise and and we're even looking at the possibility of something a little bit different in addition to all of that uh to reach a group of people that we're not uh, been able to reach and so how do we do that well <clears throat> when you do that and some people think you know we had people who think that man if it's not if it's not uh, organ and 500 year old hymns it's wrong I mean drums and synthesizers you know if you want that rock and roll music go somewhere else but that's not God honoring and it's sure not Lutheran <laughs> well let's talk about that First of all, in the book of Psalms, I believe it's the 150th Psalm, I think it is, they talk about, um, it says, praise the Lord, everything that has breath, praise the Lord, and then it talks about uh, with, uh, with lyre, harp and lyre. A lyre, L-Y-R-E, was a guitar. So there's biblical basis for using an instrument like a guitar. And then it says with cymbals, and it says loud clashing cymbals, I think that's called percussion, as in drums and cymbals. <laughs> So you can't make a case whether something's biblical or not. I mean, forget Lutheran, biblical. <laughs> Whatever instruments we want to use. And they say, well, it's not Lutheran? Well, wait a minute. 
in Luther's day, in Luther's day, 500 years ago, um, uh, the congregation rarely sang. Uh, Luther thought it would be good for the congregation to be able to express their love of God in singing. So Luther took the tunes of, of songs that people knew that they'd sing in the taverns. That's uh, kind of contemporary, right? The devil's music. God, Luther took the tunes of songs they'd sing in the taverns, and then he put theological words to them. So traditional, contemporary, pff, God didn't care. Just He says, when you worship, worship me uh, in sincerity and in truth. That's what the Bible says. Jesus says, Sinc sincerity means from the heart. So if you're going to worship and you're just sitting there like a bump on a log, then you're not worshiping him in sincerity. So you're not worshiping him. And truth means that we're here to worship the God who's revealed himself to us in the scriptures. We're not here to worship Allah. We don't worship Buddha. We don't worship Confucius. We, we, we worship the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the biblical directions for worship is do it sincerely from the heart. Don't just go through the motions and worship me. Beyond that, I don't care if you use an organ or a synthesizer or a drum or you sing a cappella. I don't care. I don't care if you dance. People, when we had, we, back a number of years ago, we had some folks raise their hands. Like, that's like, that's, that's, that's got to be wrong. That's like holy roller. Well, let's just go back to the scriptures. Lift up holy hands. Clap your hands, all you people. So you don't have to clap your hands. You don't have to lift your hands. But don't be critical of those who do lift their hands or clap their hands. So the book of Psalms. That was their songbook. Proverbs, uh, a rather bracket, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. You can write the name of Solomon because Solomon was the author of those three. A Proverbs is just a number of little statements that teach life truths. Uh, Song of Songs was a love letter that Solomon wrote to his bride. And Ecclesiastes, I mentioned that earlier. Ecclesiastes, I think Ecclesiastes is Solomon's journal about going through a midlife crisis. I mean, Solomon, he was raised, his father was David, and he was raised knowing the scriptures, but he got to the point like he just couldn't find satisfaction. You know, and they talk about, and there's nothing wrong. My, I have an uncle who's, uh, how old is he? I'm 64. He's probably late 70s. About five or six years ago, he bought a yellow Corvette. If you know my uncle, I mean, I love my uncle. He's a great guy, but he's really, really frugal. No, he's really cheap. <laughs> and for him to go buy a yellow Corvette, like, what is up with that? I mean, I thought it was great that he had one. Um, but um, uh, very, very uh, uh, frugal uh, in his ways uh, with all of that. But sometimes they talk about midlife crisis, and so you go buy a convertible, or that's when you, you, know, you, you do some things maybe you shouldn't have done. Well, Solomon is trying to find a sense of contentment in life. And he begins by saying, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Uh, and so he has all this money. Remember I said that during his dad's reign, they were in wartime, so they didn't have a lot of extra money. But in his reign, they had a lot of money. So he was building all these houses, you know, and he was building the biggest houses he could build. And, you know, they were great, but they got boring after a while. And then he'd, he'd bring in all the entertainers, you know. If he was in the 40s, he'd bring in Frank Sinatra. If he's in the 50s, I don't know, Dean Martin. I don't know, you know, Led Zeppelin. I don't know, you know, just people along the way the big entertainers, and they were great, you know, but the, kind of the excitement of that kind of wore off. And then he'd, he'd bring in the dancing girls, and he'd bring in the comedians, you know, he'd bring in the entertainers, but he never could find contentment until finally toward the end he said, you know what, I think I finally figured it out. I think really life is about recognizing the goodness and the faithfulness of God and taking delight in the gifts that he gives to me and seeking to honor him um, in the life that I live. Pretty simple. But it was a journey. And uh, here was Solomon, this man of great wisdom, who kind of fell into that kind of funk where he was struggling with those things. And then you've got um, the, those three, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Next to that, you can write major prophets, M-A-J-O-R, prophet, not financial prophets, but P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. And then the, the ones below that would be the minor, M-I-N-O-R, prophets, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. And the, not that the major prophets are more important than the minor prophets, but that the major pro those books are just longer than the minor prophets. That's the only reason. It just it's a it's a human it's a human distinction between those books. So, for example, I mentioned remember earlier that God dropped all these little clues along the way about how He was going to send a Messiah. 
and so that they could recognize him when he came. So in Isaiah, Isaiah was written around 700 B.C., and, uh, and Isaiah uh, says uh, that he will be conceived of a virgin. Now, there are a lot of things that Isaiah writes about. But that one little clue, like, what? Conceived of a virgin? You mean, so the first time, the first time that she has sexual relations, she will conceive. No. Even when she gives birth, she will still be a virgin. And how does that happen? Uh, with God, all things are possible. Um, in Isaiah 53, Isaiah... Uh, uh, right. so I think there's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, one of the clues is he will be pierced for our transgressions, crucified. But in the 7th century, when he wrote that, there was no such thing as crucifixion. The Romans um, introduced crucifixion um, into the world. That was one of their forms of capital punishment. But in the 7th or 8th century B.C., nobody crucified. But again, God speaking... Uh, to Isaiah said, I want you to communicate this. And of course he was pierced for our transgressions. So these different clues that God drops along the way. Um, I've got there uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations. Jeremiah was one of the prophets of God. Jeremiah didn't want to be a prophet. I remember when I was in college, um, I, I went to college to become a sports journalist. Um, I, I love sports and had played a lot of sports but I knew I wasn't good enough to get paid to play them, so I thought I will still stay in them uh, by being in journalism. So I went to Southern Illinois University uh, to study journalism, to be a sports journalist, and uh, when I was a sophomore in college, this thought came to mind about being a pastor. Nobody, I assure you, nobody came to me and said, Mark, we think you should be a pastor. Nobody. And this thought just came to mind, and I thought, where'd that come from? And so I tried to forget it as quickly as it came in. But it kept coming back, and it kept coming back. And, and it kept haunting me. And so uh, I changed my major like three times because I'm trying to figure out what, but I sure don't want to go to the seminary. I don't want to have to go to school four more years. I don't want to have to write a, uh, you know, a term paper every week. I don't want to have to, you know, I don't want to have to, I'm going to have to be, be better behaved if I'm going to be a pastor. I can't, <laughs> I can't want to do this. And I fought it with every ounce until finally like, the screws got tighter and tighter. And I go, okay, okay. And Jeremiah did not want to do this. And God said, Jeremiah, listen, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. And I want you to do it. But it was hard. And Jeremiah took a lot of heat from the people of his day. You know, a lot of times when you're, like, if you've not been to church, if you've been to church already today, you know what the sermon's about? Uh, you know, there are people who sit in those pews. They don't want to hear that. Yeah, we talked about our financial response to God. And there'll probably be people that, that's all he ever talks about is money. It's all he ever talks about. Uh, like once a year. Once a year. Uh, but people don't like that when they, or even when you step on their toes about certain issues. They don't like it. But our calling is to speak the word of God. Try, try to do that kindly and lovingly and graciously and winsomely to try to do it in that way, not to be, but that's our calling. Um, and Jeremiah got beat up. I mean, he literally, he got beat up. Nobody's beating me up because I preached about financial stewardship. Um, but he got beat up. And then he wrote the book of Lamentations um, to lament, to weep, because he was just, I can't keep going. And it's in the book of Lamentations, that famous verse, you know, I think about my affliction and my suffering, and, the, and yet this one, th I'm ready to throw in the towel, but this one thing I, I, I keep, keeps coming to mind, that the mercies of God are new every morning, and his faithfulness is great. And it just kept him going, he just kept on going. And sometimes in life, we're ready to throw in the towel. Maybe it's in your job, uh, maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's in a relationship with somebody. Like, I've had it, I've had it. The mercies of God are new every morning, his faithfulness is great. So the different, um, you know, Daniel, we talked about Daniel in the lion's den when he was back in, in Babylon and those kind of things. And then Hosea, again, these prophets of God that God spoke to the people through some very difficult and challenging times. And so I'm not going to unpack all of them. I'll, I'll give you one example in Micah, the book of Micah. Uh, Micah was written about 500 years before the birth of Christ. And Micah uh, wrote in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. 
So all these little clues that God drops, written 500 years before it happened, he'll be born in Bethlehem. And then, so next time what we'll do is we will finish off the New Testament, which will go much more rapidly, and then we'll finish off uh, part number one. And I told you to take us two and a half to three weeks. It'll take us probably three weeks, and that's no big deal. Uh, so next week we'll make our way through the New Testament, begin to get to know a little bit better some of the authors of the New Testament, who was Matthew, who was Mark, who was Luke, who was John, uh, Bible trivia, uh, which ones of the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John uh, were not um, apostles. Uh, some think they were all four apostles. No, they weren't. Uh, two of them were, two of them weren't. And uh, one was a physician and a historian. One was probably a teenager in Jesus' time. And we'll unpack all of that. Who was this guy who wrote half the New Testament? And uh, how was he kind of a hellraiser, literally, uh, before he became a Jesus follower? And uh, how God could use him along the way? So next week, we'll finish off um, that unit. And then the week after that, we'll continue to, to move forward. So again, if you ever have to miss a week, um, go to the YouTube. And Dean's the guy. If you need a lesson on DVD or Jump Drive, Dean's our guy who's going to make that happen. But I haven't heard from anybody that you need that, so we'll assume that YouTube works. But if not, uh, we, can, we can do that and make that happen. Um, uh, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. If you haven't put your name on the white sheet on your table, if everybody would put their name on the white sheet on the table, that's helpful for me. Um, and then um, uh, take your books with you, take your Bibles with you, and we'll be back next week, Lord willing. So let me close with prayer. Father, uh, thank you uh, for your faithfulness and your provision. As the uh, snow fell a few days ago um, and uh, in a little bit covered the ground, so uh, I'm reminded of the words of the scriptures uh, that though our sins are as scarlet, that they are covered over a uh, white as snow because of what uh, Jesus did for us. So, Lord, uh, may we be reminded um, that you are with us, uh, that you love us, that you watch over us, not because you're waiting to pounce on us, but because you care for us. And I pray that you continue to help us uh, draw closer to you, come to appreciate you more fully, and, uh, and ultimately to live out uh, what it means to be in a relationship with you. And not just to know all the biblical facts or the theological trivia, uh, but to be able to be a reflection of you as we seek to bring heaven to earth in the places where you've uh, located us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming. Amen.